So it's kind of like throw a dart and it'll be higher, but, but to get more specific, you know, when you get a bull market in these things, I mean, I expect gold to go from, you know, the 2000 to 22, 2300 it's at now to maybe 3000. So what's that a 50% move? You know, I expect silver, which was kind of 24 at the start of this thing to be at, you know, 48 within a year, maybe higher, you know, and then on its way to a hundred, you know, that's 50 bucks an ounce and, you know, maybe on its way to 75 or a hundred bucks an ounce. So, so that's a, a three or a four bagger, whereas gold's going up 50% in the same, same kind of window. So, um, so that means that there's more leverage in the silver miners. Larry, how you doing? I'm great, Andy. Thanks for having me on your show. I really enjoy uh, joining you. Yeah, well, thank you so much um, for coming up on board. And I've been a, a distant fan here for, uh, really, it's been a couple of years. I love your work and love you saying it. As I mentioned off camera, I really appreciate that you have this very broad perspective, if you would, because that's very important in the macro sense of setting everything up. Yeah. But then you're also very specific to the metals and also the metals companies. Yeah. Help me navigate through that because just really recently, I had two guests on recently that talked about the ending of the bank term funding program that ended, yeah. I want to say in March. Well, I knew it ended on March 11. And really, that's a very big negative for the banks, obviously, that that's, or it can be, that's ending. But yeah, where do we go from here? What's hitting? And also, it makes me think of, do they have something else to take that place or how do they get to compensate for taking that away? What are your thoughts yeah. holding that? It's a great question. I mean, I have to admit, I was a little surprised they ended it too, but it's, it was unclear in the terms of how they ended it. I think what, you know, as you, as you know, when they first put it in place, it went to 80 billion pretty quickly. And then I think it crept up to 120, 130 billion, um, which is interesting because first of all, that number is a lot smaller than the amount that the banks borrowed from the federal home loan board. They borrowed about a trillion dollars from the federal home loan board. They also went to the discount window. So, so it was just kind of the cosmetic thing that calmed everybody down, but it wasn't really where the big money was, was borrowed from. Um, but I think, you know, they ended the ability to have new people come in and, um, um, take out BTFP loans, but I'm not sure they required repayment on the old loans that were outstanding. It, it was kind of gray on that area. And. As long as they didn't require repayment, then effectively that money is still out there. I don't know if somebody, if a listener in knows the answer to that, they should put it in the show notes or tweet about it. But, um, but I mean, it's, you know, it, it is something that's interesting to me that they did it. I mean, you know, they take away with one hand, they give with another. I mean, they're, you know, they're running the reverse repo down and that's causing the money supply to grow or the base money supply to grow. Um, you know, I, I, I'm sure they're thinking of other programs. I mean. I've been referring to this ISDA letter. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but the, um, the ISDA letter, ISDA, the, the Securities and Derivatives Association, which is really the banks, wrote a letter to the Federal Reserve saying, we think you should change your supplementary leverage ratio, SLR, to not have treasuries counted as part of the leverage on the part of the banks. And effectively what that is, is they, the banks want to be able to borrow an unlimited amount of money from the Fed with which to buy treasuries. And so the banks would be the ones monetizing the debt. So that's okay. kind of QE infinity and yeah, yeah. It's, it's complicated, but that's, that's what it boils down to. Right. So that's huge. Yeah, uh, it is huge. That's <laughs> huge. So can we work that out a little bit more? So that's banks borrowing directly from the fed. And I'm assuming they would never have to pay it back. I think that's right. I think that's right. I mean, What's not clear is what the terms would be, but I'm, I'm assuming the Fed will make it on a, you know, in the basis where the, the banks can make a spread. And so, I mean, what we, what we're kind of dancing around here, as we all know, is that the, you know, the government's terribly over indebted and the debt is, you know, the cost of the debt, which is running at 1.1 trillion a day, headed to 1.6, um, is really, you know, blowing a hole in the, helping to blow a hole in the budget. And so, you know, the Fed's got to, find ways and means of getting people to buy the debt and, and make it look like they're not printing money. And, you know, a change in the supplementary leverage ratio would be one way of doing that. So I expect the Fed to continue to as much as possible behind the scenes, try to keep, you know, the money spigot flowing. 
but try to hide it as much as possible as well, because they also know that everyone seeing that is going to therefore, you know, um, uh, you know, anticipate inflation and, and pay, you know, push the inflation rate up. Right. So, um, you know, they're, they're really, the fed is really horribly trapped and they can't, you know, the, 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 with the leverage that exists in the system, they can't stop printing money or else everything will collapse. Right. Um, but in turn, as you and I both know, that printing of money is what leads to inflation. And they've got a lot of people complaining about inflation, rightly so. Um, so they, you know, they, one, they've kind of cooked the inflation prints, but they have managed the prints have come down from, you know, kind of nine to three. And my sense is based on recent comments by Powell, that they're going to kind of declare three is good enough for government work. We're getting, we're going to get to two and therefore we are going to do some cuts because if they don't do the cuts, as I said earlier, that $1.1 trillion interest cost that the federal government is now bearing with our project is projected to go to 1.6 by the end of calendar 2024. So that's another, you know, $500 billion of, of deficit. I mean, that's the other thing I should point out that I just think I'm, I'm in the process of writing my first quarter letter. And so several things jumped out at me. Um, the biggest one, and these are things that everyone's known, but it, you know, you got to put them together in the first quarter or the fourth quarter of, uh, 2023, which is the first fiscal quarter. Cause the federal government has a September year end, the government ran a $500 billion deficit. So if you annualize that times four, it's a. 2 billion run rate and it's, it's lumpy and, and that may not be right, but it's close. Um, in turn, they also recently, uh, as well as, uh, Washington times had headline that said in a hundred days, the government debt went up by $1 trillion. So U S federal government debt grew by $1 trillion in a hundred days. Well, there are 365 days in a year. So if that rate were annualized, that would mean the federal debt is growing by $3.65 trillion per year, which is a lot bigger than the $2 trillion deficit and which would probably yeah. represent a growth of 10% in the federal debt. Whereas in GDP, I think is growing at around 2.6 or 2.8. So, you know, they're, they're just, they're trapped in a mathematical doom loop where, you know, the, the debt just keeps growing faster than the, the means to pay it. And really the only way out, I mean, we've, you know, Reinhardt and Rogoff and all the studies have shown that, you know, in, in all countries that have done this, where they've got the debt to GDP as high as it is, they're, you know, they're kind of three ways out. You, know, you can have a collapse, a debt collapse and all the debt defaults, or you can have, you know, high inflation or you can hyperinflation. Um, you know, my, my sense is obviously they want to avoid a collapse. They want to avoid hyperinflation, but. But I'm, I'm quite sure they'd, they'd be willing, I mean, it's, it's a bad choice, but they'll be willing to live with high inflation because that's their only way out. So, so I think high yeah. inflation is in our future and that's why, you know, the sound money assets, you know, gold, silver, and Bitcoin are all, you know, record at record highs and, and pushing higher because I think the market, I mean, you know, those of us who are in this community have known this for a couple of years, but we've been sitting back and waiting for it to happen. And what's, what's happened now is it's, 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 it's becoming, it's becoming very clear, you know, everyone, everyone sees it. And that, so that's, that's what the markets are telling us. They, they know what's going to happen, even though the fed hasn't formally pivoted. Although in his most recent press conference, Powell did say they might start reducing the quantitative tightening, which is by itself, that, that's a form of easing, right? Right. Now, it's interesting. He said they might start doing that because they didn't want to encounter a problem similar to the problem they had in September of 2019 when the repo market blew, fell apart and that led to the first Powell pivot. So, so what you've got here is, is a federal agency that the market knows what they're going to have to do. Maybe even they know what they're going to have to do, but they're trying to delay it and hide it <laughs> as right. long as they can. So, yeah. but the market's calling bullshit and that's why, that's why these metals are working so well. Yeah, well, I want to talk about the metals here, um, but let's talk first about the uh, the bond market here. Sure. The, the interest rates are starting to spike here, yeah. and I guess that would be, yeah. Give me your give me your thoughts on the bond market because that is not good as far as 
It's really not. And and this is a continuation of what we saw. I mean, we had a, a, a version of this in the fall of last year, right? As you'll recall, in September, October, the U.S. 10-year yield went from, you know, sub four, around four, up to well over five very quickly. Right. Kind of reminded me of the U.K. guilt crisis the fall before, you know, that caused Liz Trust to lose her job and for them to reverse their quantitative tightening and so forth. And um, And what, you know, and this was in my fourth quarter report, we wrote about this, how when that happened, the alarm bells went off at the Fed and they very quickly had about 15 Fed speakers saying, well, tightening cycle's over. (laughs) Interest rates have done what we need them to do and we're, you know, we're good. And so immediately bond market said, oh, tightening cycle's over, more easy money coming. That means bond yields are going to come down. And so the Fed, you know, they they jumped on it and brought the the 10 year back down from over five to under four in a relatively short period of time. Really quick. Yeah, yep. very quickly. And so it just shows how they can jawbone and they can manipulate these markets. But in the longer term, you know, the trend is what it is. And, you know, the, the, I mean, I, I believe we're, we firmly have an inflationary trend going on here. I mean, when you see, you know, wages or any kind of metric that you look at, more recently, it's commodity prices are hitting all-time highs. I mean, the price of cocoa just blew out. I mean, that's that's you know, related really more to a supply issue with the cocoa farmers in Africa. But, but the point is that, you know, oil is, oil has been strong. I mean, it's up over yeah. eight years again. I mean, you know, we, we inflation is there, you know, and, and uh, Tavi Costa has a great chart that he puts up very often on Twitter where he shows that in the seventies, you know, an inflationary decade, there were waves of inflation. You get the first wave and then they tighten and it comes down, but it's at a higher, you know, the low is higher than the old starting point. And you get the next wave and they tighten, you know, and, and so forth. And so, you know, I think mean, that's what happened, right? I mean, in 2020, 2021, they were complaining they didn't have any inflation. You know, then they got some, they said it was transitory. Then, then they realized, oh, no shit, it's a lot more than transitory. This is a real damn problem. <laughs> and they, yeah. um, they jumped on it and raised rates really quick. And that yeah. brought headline prints from nine down to three. But, um, you know, off they went. You brought up the 1970s and I was... A young kid um, that, but I do remember, I do remember it. And I think obviously every, every time in history is different, but I think if you were to draw a parallel, it seems it, like it rhymes, trend. clearly rhymes. Uh, yeah. and it's that, that was driven a little bit by the oil, Arab oil embargoes, uh, you know, so there's well, what do you have now? Right. <laughs> what, yeah. Right. Well, that's right. But. Uh, but it definitely rhymes. I mean, look, we had a great 40 year deflationary trend from 1980 all the way to 2020. And in the March collapse in 2020, the 10 year U.S. Treasury traded at 60 basis points or something like that. And, you know, ever since then, in my opinion, we've entered an inflationary decade and it's going to be driven by the debt problem and, and the monetization and the monetization of the debt problem. So, um, you know, as, as that continues, um, you know, we've, we've got, I mean, until this thing gets solved, I think we live in an inflationary world. I mean, sometimes it'll be higher, sometimes it'll be lower, but we've, we've got inflation in our future. So. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think that's, and I agree with you. I think that's really the only way out. Yeah. Uh, Right. You know, and it's, it's one of the, I guess the past that's least painful, which it's actually more painful, more pe- painful for, especially the middle to lower class. Oh, absolutely. No, it's incredibly painful for a lot of people. I mean, you're causing the working class to pay for the excesses of the monetary class. Right. You know, the, the 1% on over half of the financial assets and, you know, have made out like bandits over those last, you know, 20, 30 years. And the working class hasn't seen their real wages grow at all. If not, they've probably in many cases shrunk. Yeah. And, now you're talking about massive inflation. Well, when you start off with millions or billions of dollars, like some of these you know, high-end guys have, even if the price of gas goes to ten dollars, you can afford it. You know, whereas you know Joe Sixpack is, is you know you know eating cheese sandwiches to cut costs, right? I mean, right. You know, it's yeah. just tough. I mean, yeah, it's very very sad the way this whole thing has happened, and you know, I mean. You and I haven't talked before, but I mean, I'm sure you know the whole history of it all. I mean, probably the, the biggest event that drove it was going off the gold standard in 71 when Nixon broke the agreement to limit the money supply growth by the 
based on the amount of gold we had, that was a big deal. Um, yep. and, uh, you know, it's taken a long time to manifest itself. It, it quickly manifested itself in the seventies, but then they got it under control. Volcker was kind of a hero, put up the rates a lot. Uh, and that created the deflationary trend. You got had a lot of deflationary things. You had a lot of technology, you know, in 2000, China came along and, you know, you had a, a billion people who would work for, you know, 50 cents an hour. And so that, mm -hmm. that was very deflationary, you know, um, right. it was a lot of cheap goods. Um, right. so, you know, um, but, but those trends are, I think we've come to the natural end of those trends. I mean, and so I, I see inflation in our future. Well, it certainly seems like things are coming to an end and it's, and we'll see what happens, but it's kind of indicative of where the metals are, how they've been reacting here recently. Yeah. I mean, gold's been on a tear for really, uh, I want to say the last several weeks, uh, well, last week it's been just, it's gone. It seems like almost a parabolic. Yeah, you know, both gold and silver. And, I, and I, caution, I, I caution people. I mean, yeah, you know, we can be in a bull market and these things are going to correct. I mean, it, you know, anyone with any experience in markets knows that, you know, a good way of looking at whether you're getting in at, you know, a good price or not is to compare the price to the 200-day moving average. And mm. both gold and silver are stretched very, very high above the 200-day moving average. And, you know, I think we're in, bull mark in a bull market. I think the end of the year, gold might be 3000, silver might be 40, but, um, but I'm not saying that it's going to be a straight line from the prices we're at now to that price. I, I, I fully expect just because it's a pattern that's pretty predictable. I fully expect both of them to correct back to the breakout point or something near that at some, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it's, you're starting to, you're starting to get the signs. Everybody's talking about it. They, they're talking about it on CNBC. I mean, it's, you know, people are pretty excited and so. That excitement is going to lead to the, the last buyer coming in and, and then, you know, okay. And they're expecting quick riches and it won't happen and, and we'll get a correction. Right. Uh, but to me, that correction will be an enormous buying opportunity. I, mean, I, I, you know, we, we, we've sold a few things that we think got ahead of themselves in, in the fund I manage and, and we're waiting for that correction to occur. And, and we're looking at some other stuff that's still quite cheap that we'll probably buy on the correction. So, um, I mean, and, and look, I mean, even if you, if you have a multi-year time frame, you could buy right now and be fine. You know, you just gotta, you gotta recognize the fact that you get a 10% pullback here pretty easily. Yeah, no, I would agree. And actually I have my own book that, um, recently, I mean, it's been underwater <laughs> since last year, but actually recently it's done well, but I'm looking to add to it. I'm looking for that, um, that pullback here. I'm waiting for that pullback. Um, you, you manage a lot of mining companies, a lot of stocks. Uh, mm -hmm. what's looking cheap, what's looking interesting here right now? Well, um, yeah. So, I mean, at a, at a big picture level, um, there's, there's more torque in the silver miners than any place else in the world. Right. I mean, so, yeah. so first of all, there's torque in all these stocks. They've all been just beaten to shit. Right? I mean, it's been, I mean, it's been an amazingly tough bear market and I, the sentiment, you know, three, six months ago, or even a month or two ago. It was about as bad as I've ever seen it in a junior mining camp. And the values were just, I mean, on a valuation basis, it, it was stunningly cheap. Yeah. But um, it didn't really matter. You know? I mean, because everyone hated them and still does to a degree. Um, so, so it's kind of like throw a dart and it'll be higher. But, but to get more specific, you know, when you get a bull market in these things, I mean, I expect gold to go from, you know, the 2000 or 22, 2300 it's at now to maybe 3000. So what's that a 50% move? You know, I expect silver, which was kind of 24 at the start of this thing to be at, you know, 48 within a year, maybe higher, you know, and then on its way to a hundred, you know, that's 50 bucks an, an ounce and, you know, maybe on its way to 75 or a hundred bucks an ounce. So, so that's a, a three or a four bagger, whereas gold's going up 50% in the same kind of window. So, um, so that means that there's more leverage in the silver miners and, um, you know, the obvious big names there are Pan American and Coor and Heckler. And I own all those and believe, you know, they're all in their own way. They're all good companies with risks and opportunities. And then on the smaller silver miners, there's some great names there too. I, I own Guanajuato. I own Vino. Um, I own Silver Tiger, um, you know, and, and many, many others that are some drill stories, et cetera. So, um, you know, that's, that's kind of the. You know, that with, within the mining category, I should, I should say, 
The mining category kind of broadly falls into three buckets of companies. A bucket one is company producers, and this is the safest bucket. And by the way, there's a lot of upside in these producers, and especially the growing ones. But these guys have a mine that's operating and they have positive cash flow. And so if you're not familiar with this area and you're looking to get into this area, I'd start there because, you know, producers don't generally fail. They do fail, but, but you know, much at a much lower rate than the other two buckets, which I'm going to come to in a minute. <laughs> so, so, you know, if you've got a company that's got a mine and the mine is operating, the mine's generating positive cash flow, and you can look, see, does it have EBITDA, does it have earnings? Well, okay. You know, they don't need to go to the market to raise money. And, and then of course you look for how much you're paying for the earnings and how much is their production going to grow and do they have a good pipeline of future projects that'll make them a bigger company over time. And, and so the two things that'll drive the growth and value of your investment are they produce more ounces over time. That's because they have a good pipeline. They build new mines mm -hmm. and the multiple expands, you know, I've got things that are trading at three times cash flow and, you know, as we all know, in a bull market, they'll trade at six or nine or 12 or 15 times cash flow, same cash flow, but stocks gone up 300%. So. Um, right. so the producers are kind of the place you start. And then the next bucket down is a, is a slightly riskier bucket called the developers and the developers have a deposit. It's in the ground. You know, the metal is there because it's got a 43 101 report that says the metal is there. You basically know it's there and you can do some math and say, okay, you know, this thing has 5 million ounces and it's selling it. X hundred million dollars say, so it's, you know, selling at $20 an ounce in the ground. And, um, and what they've got generally is then they have a preliminary economic estimate or a feasibility study where they're going to turn these ounces into a mine. But to begin with, you know, those ounces are, they're not going away. I mean, unless the government of the country takes them or whatever, they're not going away. So there's a, there's an underlying fundamental asset value as a result of having those ounces in the ground. So that you know, the odds of this company going to zero are low, but they're not, it's not zero because they don't have any cash flow yet. Mm -hmm. And so the, the problem they're what they're dealing with is how do I raise the money to build the mine? What, what does the mine cost to build and what will the mine generate in cash flow once it's built? And the general rule of thumb is you'd like to have a mine that, you know, would pay back in a year or two. So, and, and has a, a life of 10 years. So that means if you put up a hundred million Maybe you can hope that the mine will generate 50 million of cash flow a year. So in two years, you've got your, you know, your bait back in terms of the cost to build it. And then the next eight years, you've got 50 million of income. And so, um, that's just kind of a rule of thumb. So, you know, and that's a development story. And of course the risks there are that it takes longer to build or it costs more to build or the grades aren't as good as they said. I mean, there are a zillion risks and that's why these things are, and, and you've got to raise, you know, you've got to raise the hundred million. Mm -hmm. So you got to look at the market cap and then you got to think about, well, can they borrow, you know, can they use debt? Do they want to use debt? And, you know, there's, so, so you got to kind of factor all those things in and say, all right, they, you know, they're going to raise the money. That's going to dilute me this amount. But when this mine is built, it's going to generate 50 million of cash flow, which at a, you know, say call it a 10 multiple makes it a $500 million company, you know, and I'm paying what 70 million for it today. I don't know, you know. I factor in the dilution from the new share issuance for the building and so on and so forth. So, you know, so in, in that category, in that bucket, you know, you can expect to make, you know, more money, um, maybe than the producers because they're going to bring this new thing online. Depends again on the pricing, but you've got all the risks of building the mine. And the third bucket is the real wildcat bucket, which is, um, kind of the, the drill story, you know, discovery bucket where. You know, the people, you've got some geologists, they've got a good background. They know what they're doing. They've got a big piece of dirt somewhere in the world, hopefully in a jurisdiction that's safe and that's where they're going to be able to get a permit to build the mine and they're poking holes in the ground and, and, you know, the geometry of what they are poking in the ground would lead you to believe that maybe they've got a deposit that's, you know, a million, two million, five million, ten million, twenty million ounces, 20 million would be huge. Um, and of course these companies, they have zero cash flow. They continually dilute you because they need to raise money to drill. But as long as the money they raise finds more gold, you know, they can go up in a value quite substantially because they're starting off at such a low valuation. And they, you know, if, if you go from the, there are companies that start off with $10 million market caps and maybe they've got 5 million of that in cash and they use the 5 million to drill. Well, if the drilling reveals a million ounces, 
you know, I mean, a low value for a million ounces is, is 10 bucks, you know, and a higher value is 20 and a higher value that's 30, which is not uncommon. So suddenly you've got kind of a three bagger there. And then, you know, I mean, this is the riskiest area by the way, but, but of course the hope is that they find something that's not just a million ounces. It's looking like it'd be two, three, four, five, and, uh, you know, and then you can get big multiples on your money. So, you know, if you look at how I do it, how we do it, we're probably 60% in the you know, in the, in the producers that have cash flow and maybe, you know, 30% in the, in the produce and the development stories that are, you know, developing mine to have cash flow. And then the balance, maybe the 10% are kind of the drill stories where they're trying to try to find a big deposit. So, or prove a big deposit exists. So and it's, it's based a lot on geology and the geologists that you have and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's, you know, that's kind of how we go about it. Got it. Is there any jurisdictions that you don't like or right? Like, yeah. Or that you yeah. Say, I mean, it's, it's funny. Uh, I think Rick rolls guy who said every jurisdiction's at risk and he's right. Cause every government could eventually grab these mines or tax these mines. Or I mean, Joe Biden was talking at one point about putting a, a royalty an NSR royalty on every mining operation in the U S I don't think he'd ever get it through, but if he did, it would ruin mining in Nevada. Um, yeah. I mean, there's certain ones that are not so good. Like Ecuador has kind of always been known as, as not being so good. Although, you know, the London family has been operating successfully there now. A lot of countries have kind of gone in the wrong direction. You know, Peru and Argentina and Chile used to all be pretty safe, but um, you know, there are issues in those areas. Um, Canada is very safe in terms of rule of law. It's become very difficult in terms of the permitting process because of ESG. It just takes longer to build a mine. You know, a lot of people are very afraid of Africa and there are a couple of places in Africa that are horrific, like, you know, the DRC and, and so forth. But, um, but in general, um, you know, Africa is not a bad place to mine because the permitting is pretty straightforward. You can build a mine quickly. Labor is pretty cheap, um, et cetera. So, uh, we've got some companies that are doing work in Africa and are pretty attractive. Um, you know, that's, it's, it's a constant battle though, because I mean, uh, you know, you, I mean, uh, Panama just went negative and, and grabbed right. a huge mine. Um, you know, you just, you just never really know, um, you know, these things literally are gold mines. They're literally worth a lot of money. You know, governments are pretty corrupt and, you know, it's not hard to see how a government can decide, you know what, we need to own this. I mean, they you know, Kyrgyzstan yep. did it to Sentara. I mean, it's just, you know, or, or, you know, we don't like what you're doing environmentally. We need to shut you down. You know, yeah. uh, so it's, it's tricky. I mean, the, I mean, I, I would say our, our focus in the three best jurisdictions in our opinion are the United States, Canada, and Australia. Yeah. Uh, for that reason. Speaking of that, but yes, the United States, but maybe the absence of California. I, I yeah. asked Rick, if you know, where wouldn't he go? He well, said, he's no, right. I mean, I just experienced that firsthand. I had a, a <laughs> development story there called Rise Gold, which just got, I mean, just totally abused by the legal process and all. I mean, it's just absolutely horrific. They didn't follow the rule of law. They didn't, they didn't do anything. I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's right. I mean, California probably is a uh, bad a jurisdiction as exists in the United States. Nevada is probably as good a jurisdiction. Right. Uh, and Arizona, I think is pretty positive as well. Um, but there's been a mine, there's a big mine built in the Carolinas and you know, generally speaking, I mean, the mining is, you know, mining used to be dirty and, and, um, you know, the standards were not followed. Um, and I will say in the, to the miners credit, you know, they've now got standards of what they do and recovery and, you know, and repopulation. I mean, you can see places that have been mined, you can't even tell. Um, yeah. and, and so, and that's all factored into the plan and the cost or else it won't be approved. Yeah. So. It's interesting. Well, Larry, I think we should probably end on there. If uh, somebody wants to use your services, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So, um, well, first of all, I'm on Twitter under my name, Lawrence Lepard. So, and I make a lot of noise. I hate the Federal Reserve. You're very and active. Some, and I sometimes tweet about <laughs> names and companies that we're involved with. Um, yeah. um, we have a website that uh, for the fund that we manage, it's called, the fund the company's called Equity Management Associates. Uh, the website we have is E M A Edward Mark Alpha, the number two dot com. You can go on there, and you can see our results. You can see our quarterly letters. We every quarter we write a macro, a summary of our portfolio and macro background, and it's all free. And you can sign up for it if you just 
any of your email there, you'll get those free, you know, by MailChimp. We'll never spam you. Um, so that's all, you know, free macro stuff. And then the fund itself, um, we do accept new investors from time to time. We have a couple of slots. We're accepting new investors, but because of the SEC rules and all the bullshit they put us through, we, you know, I've had a lot of guys say, can I give 20, 50 grand? Sadly, we can't do that. Um, the minimum account size is 200 grand, but if you've got 200 grand and you want to participate in the fund, uh, you should just reach out. It's easy to do that on the site and it has our emails and all that stuff. You know, we can do a zoom call explaining the risks and benefits. And, you know, when you're, if you get it at the right time of the cycle, um, this thing really can be explosive. I mean, 2019, we're up seven, 97% in 2020, we're up 122%, but full disclosure, since then we've been down quite a bit, you know, 40 to 50%. But I feel like we are kind of turning the corner and we're, you know, given what we described earlier about the, the macro picture of how trapped the fed is, I think that, you know, I think we're about to experience another very, very significant up leg. You know, and the fund should perform pretty well if, if I'm right about that. So that's kind of the, how we see it. That's where you're at. Yeah, and I would agree with you. Well, Larry, I want to just thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're oh, thank you, man. It's really nice to be with you and happy to yeah. come back anytime. Yeah, I'd love to have you on. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have a great time. Great day. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.